Yes, we are here. You made it. We made it. What a wonderful day that is before us. This is the day of the Lord, and we are rejoicing, and we are so glad in it. Are you here? Yes. God is doing a new thing in this house. He's doing a new thing in our Kitely family. He's doing a new thing over this mighty family of grace, and we are rejoicing in it. I am Treva Reed. I'm honored to be here to serve and helping to lead us through today's program. Uh, I come here from Oakland, California, where I serve as an Oakland City Council member, uh, but most importantly, I'm a sister to the Kitely family and a daughter of the Most High God, and I'm just... I'm overjoyed, and so I hope that I can contain all that I am feeling, the well of emotions inside of me as we come into this wonderful day and seeing you here to celebrate our family as we join together as one family. It's beautiful. The scripture, Isaiah 43, 19, it tells us about the new thing that God is doing. I hope you can see it. I hope you can feel it. I know you will hear it through the move of God today. He is here with us as we come into the formal installation service of Dr. Patrick Kiley. Woo! Over Grace Christian Center. Yes, stand to your feet. I see it, I see it. Yes, hallelujah, hallelujah. This is going to be a wonderful day as we celebrate God setting in your new senior pastor, Dr. Patrick Kiley and welcoming his amazing family into Grace Christian Center, while I know you already have been overwhelming him with love. And so we're gonna come into the day with a welcome from your mayor and my soror, doctor, I mean mayor, Debbie Nash King. And I just wanna share for those who are new to Colleen, as God is doing a new thing in Colleen, he is doing a great thing under the leadership of Mayor Nash King. She has just been a phenomenal leader here she is a woman who has served in many different capacities. She serves as a member of Harker Heights Rotary Club. She's a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. She is in the Colleen Sister Cities um, a circle. She is on the Osan Korean Committee. She's also a part of the Hispanic American Chamber of Commerce of Central Texas. She's in the Military Officers Association of America. She's a Korean War Veterans Association member. She's a Veterans Helping Veterans member. I mean, our mayor here is doing it all. And I know it takes a lot to serve in an elected role. I mean, I can go on and on. And, and the Girl Scouts Woman of Distinction Award for her leadership, making sure that we empower the young women and bringing them up into their roles of leadership in the city and throughout the region but she also has served. She is originally from Pine Bluff, Arkansas, where she also graduated from the University of Arkansas, but she was commissioned and has served our country as a second lieutenant in the United States Army. And she has not stopped serving, she will not stop serving, and we're excited that this house is connected to Mayor Nash King and just excited with the relationship that will grow and flourish between her and this house more as Dr. Patrick Kitely comes into leadership here. And so we wanna welcome you to welcome us. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. First, all I wanna say is to God be the glory. They say many are called, but few are chosen. And I look around this room, you are chosen with a purpose and a plan and God will order our step. I take no, no glory in what I do. I thank God for ordering my step. Who I am is because of him. I want you to understand that. And I thank you, Sarah, I love you. To Dr. Patrick and Marlena, Kitely, and your family, welcome to the city of Killeen. <laughs> You know, as I was sitting down and reflecting back, when Pastor Terry and Jan Whitley, I used to attend church here under their leadership. And God, we know we love them with all our heart and soul because they were leaders. 
And that's uh, one thing they always say, never give a politician or a minister the mic, because, you know, we can go on. And I'm tr truly thankful for their leadership. I used to be an usher back there on the door with Miss Faye. And one thing they taught us is how to serve. In order to be an effective leader, you must know how to serve. And they touch millions of lives. And they gave you that opportunity to serve within the church. So I remember we used to have every Saturday, if anybody can go back in them days, I'm not telling my age, but we used to have prayer circles around. And I was growing in Christ. And they'll give you the opportunity to pray. And see, that's what we must do. As leaders, we must help others and develop them, not only to be leaders, but to be God-fearing men and women leaders. Because you need that leadership throughout this city, throughout this nation. And you have to have individuals that you know that's willing to have a servant heart to give back. So as you and your family, one thing you told me, and also my Sarah, you have the spirit of excellence. She told me that. But you also have a servant heart. And that is going to carry you to places that no man has seen, nor eyes nor ears have heard. Because God has called you for such as a time as this. Now, in the city of Colleen, we got our challenges. The biggest thing that we focus on is our youth, our seniors. And just trying to make sure our city is safe. And with you with the heart of a servant that's willing to minister to God's people. See, God say grace and mercy. Because we all got grace. Come on. And we all have mercy. But I just met you. And you and your wife, y'all going to be a dynamic team. You're just continuing the legacy. Because God already laid the foundation. And the legacy is his people. And I love that. That God, he knows our time and our season and where we need to be. And we need you in the city of Colleen. And we're grateful and we are thankful. To God be the glory. Bless you. Yes, that's my kind of mayor. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you, Father. We thank you for how you're filling up our hearts, how you're filling up this house, oh God, how you're filling up this city, how you're filling up this region, oh God, how you're filling up this nation with your presence, oh God. We thank you for the shift, oh God, the acceleration, oh God, of how you are moving in and through our lives in this place, in this house, in this city, oh God, and how you are advancing and progressing on your legacy, oh God, in this house, through the bloodline, oh God. And we honor you, Lord God, as we come into this day. Have your way. We celebrate you, Father, as we celebrate this amazing installation service of your son coming into his new season. We bless you. And so let's come on and bring worship in with Pastor Deuce and Pastor Haley and rise and worship the Lord. Amen. Can we just stand up to our feet? If you got to get out your seat to worship, that's okay. Don't be ashamed. Come on. Okay, let's sing this one. If you walked in sick, you're going to walk out healed. If you walked in bound, you're going to walk out free. It's just the mention of his name. Just the mention of his name. Just the mention of his name. Everything can change. Everything can change. Yeah. If you walked in hell, you're gonna walk out like. If you walked in weary, you're gonna be alright. Yeah. It's just the mention of his name. Just the mention of his name. Just the mention of his name. Everything can change. Everything can change. Hey. If you walk in down, you're gonna walk out. If you walk in empty, say he's gonna fill your It's just the mention of his name. Just the mention of his name. Just the mention of his name.
of Jesus. It's the mighty name of Jesus. It's the mighty name of Jesus. It's the name that has the power. It's the mighty name of Jesus. It's the mighty name of Jesus. It's the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, sing if you walked in sick. Come on, sing. If you walked in sick. Gonna walk out here if you walked in now. You're gonna walk out. You walked in heavy if you walked in. Let the light grow. Yeah. 
prepare the way, prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way, prepare the way of the Lord. Come on, sing that out loud. Prepare the way, prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way. there's somebody in this room who's coming to do some business today. This is an announcement. This day is an announcement to every principality, to every demonic foe. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. There's a shifting in the atmosphere. There's a breaking in the atmosphere right now. Oh, we come together. We come together in agreement right now. Oh, mountain. Be made low, O valley, be raised up, O mountain, be made low, O valley, be raised up, O mountain, be made low. Just begin to sing your own song to him right now. 
Just begin to lift your worship. Just begin to lift your worship to Him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, worship changes the atmosphere. Worship changes regions. Worship changes nations. Worship changes the earth. Oh, we lift up a sound. We lift up a sound to you, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus.
sing it out. Say, worthy you were. He's worthy. He's holy. Worthy forever. Forever and ever and ever. Forever and ever. Lift up your hands, come on. Come on, just lift up your hands. Let's sing this one more time. Forever Yahweh. Forever Yahweh. One more time. Forever Yahweh. And what I want you to do is just get your hands together. Let's give the Lord a great big hand clap. Come on, come on, come on. A little bit more, a little bit more. Now, one, two, three, let's shout his name, ready? One, two, three, Jesus. Amen. What's his name? His name is Jesus. Before you sit down, we want to welcome you all here today. But before you sit down, I want you to high five seven people and tell them, tell them, I like it right here. Come on, tell somebody, I like it right here. Those watching online, High five yourself and tell yourself, I like it right here. We want to welcome you here tonight. Amen. Those of you who are watching online, welcome to the installation service. We're so honored to be here today. We're going to have a wonderful time in the presence of the Lord. Amen. How many are glad to be here today? Amen. It's an honor. Well, we have a great, do you have your programs? Pull your programs out. They were given to you today. And uh, we have a great program set in place. And uh, we're going to just right off the bat get into the word, we're following the word. We have a, a 20 minute video presentation. The theme of this installation is two streams, one river. Amen. And so it's amazing how God's just joined us together as a family already. What a quick work God's been doing. And uh, so we're just, my wife Marlena and I and our family, we're just so honored to be here at Grace here in Colleen and to come to this day. It's happened quickly. And uh, that's how God moves. He moves quickly. Amen. But we're going to get into the word. And then following that will be uh, the, the video presentation. You're going to enjoy it. And I uh, better pull out your tissue because it's a, it's a tearjerker for sure. But uh, without further ado, we have a wonderful, I don't even want to call him a keynote speaker. They have that in the notes. A keynote speaker. He's just a, a powerful man of God whom our family has known since about 1970. And uh, my grandmother and my father and different on the mother as well, known him for many years. And actually, we were looking at our family history, and uh, we looked at the brochures. My wife pulled them out this week of when we, when we were pastoring, our family's pastoring in California at the 30th anniversary brochure, the 40th anniversary brochure, 
a 50th anniversary brochure. Also, when we were set in as senior pastors in Oakland, the 43rd anniversary brochure, as well as uh, my father's funeral as well. Every single one of the brochures, Bishop Joseph Garlington was the keynote speaker. And uh, so it is apropos, not just in the earth, but in the heavenlies, that uh, he comes and shares the word of the Lord today. So you better get your seatbelts ready because we have a mighty man of God in this house. And I want you to rise to your feet and let's welcome Bishop Joseph Garlington as he comes to share the word of the Lord today. stand. Actually, go ahead and be seated. That's it. That'd be, that'd be great. What, what a delight. I mean, absolute delight to be here in this moment. I just feel so honored to be a part and then overwhelmed by all that history that we have. But you can build history without realizing that you're, that's what you're doing. And you end up in places that you never thought you would be in. But to be here at this time, in this place, for this moment to celebrate the goodness of God. I have so much that I owe to God for the Kitely family, how much they've poured into us. And uh, I'm in Pittsburgh because of a word <coughs> that Pastor Bonnie gave me without knowing, uh, because she, it was just part of the message. I was in, living in D.C. at the time, and, uh, and I was contemplating whether or not I should move to Pittsburgh. And so I'm sitting in the meeting waiting for her to speak, and then she said, I'm taking my text from Deuteronomy. The land to which I send you is a land of hills and valleys. Well, that's a perfect description of Pittsburgh. And so I didn't hear the rest of the message because I got in my car and drove to Pittsburgh. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to uh, refer to, to Mary when Mary said to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. So whenever you hear that, you need to do that. I want to honor those who are here with us. I was in, uh, I guess I was in South Africa, and there were so many pastors, and the guy who was called to speak, he said, uh, I don't have time to name everybody, so all protocols honored. So I don't know. <laughs> but it's a joy. I mean, some awesome people here. I want to be like Dr. Garlow when I grow up. And I'm um, just so grateful to have him in the world serving the body of Christ, he and his wife. They've done such an amazing job. I leaned over and I said to her just a few minutes ago, I said, when you see your granddaughter on the platform leading us in worship, doesn't that just give you a thrill? And it's amazing to see three generations and uh, actually four. There is, there's Mama Kitely over there who who has been such a huge part of this family. She came and sat next to us. Actually, she didn't get sit, sit next to us. And so she said, uh, am I sitting here? And I said, my mother told my congregation when they were celebrating our church and how great the Covenant Church was and how great Joseph Garlington was. And she just stopped and she said, hold on a minute. She said, don't be for me wouldn't be no covenant church. So uh, <laughs> I just want you to know, don't be for her. Y'all wouldn't have a church here. But as Britney Spears said to her second husband, I won't keep you long, all right? <clears throat> all right, we, we do. I, and... <laughs> and <laughs> I've got to catch a plane, and so uh, I'm, I'm pressed to be done. I, I do want to focus on, on a guy who introduced me to Africa in a big way, Tom Duchel. Thank you so much. I came to, came to Zimbabwe, and when I heard that you were going to be here, I just said, this has got to be one of those Kairos moments, and so I'm, I'm appreciative of who you are. D. 
be flat. I have to hear it. I sing by ear. Can I hear it a little more? Is there a, is there a hearer up here? Oh, no, you guys don't have monitors. You do that ear in the ear thing. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Come on, sing it all my life. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath. Of the goodness. I was in Chicago and uh, they had worked me like a rented mule. And I was so worn out. And so as we came to the close of a three day service that involved about seven services, a presbytery and uh, three messages on one Sunday, when he said, Amen to dismiss the church. I got up and I ran through the crowd to get out. I wanted out bad. And, uh, and the guy stopped me. And he said, do you remember me? We met 30 years ago. And I, sh I yelled at him. I said, no, I don't remember you. And then I continued running. And I could feel this guy touching me saying, Bishop Garlington, Bishop Garlington. But I acted like I didn't know. He was calling on me. And so I went into the green room and sat down. He followed me. And I looked up and he said, didn't you hear me calling you? And I decided I'm not going to waste a lie here. Because you only get so many in life, you know. And uh, I, I just didn't say anything. He said, I had something I wanted to give you. And he held up an, uh, an envelope. I recognized the envelope, and I recognized the thickness of it. <laughs> because it had money in it. He was chasing me to give me money. And I thought of that bridge. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. Now, the reason I asked the band to stay was that they could help with this because there's certain rhythmic things in there that he can't do on the keyboard. So, drummer, join the party with the bass guy. You guys were good. Come on. Your goodness, stand up. After running after me, your goodness, your goodness is running after My life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Come on, lift your voice, your goodness. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Surrender now, I give you it. Your goodness is running out. The chance. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath. the goodness of God. Come on, celebrate His goodness. You may be seated.
this March, we were visiting South Africa. And uh, we're in a, a place in South Africa that was a little warmer than where we normally would be. And it was very, very hot. And the Sunday morning that we were doing ministry, um, my associate, who is an amazing musician, he was trying to figure out what the sound was that was in the room that they couldn't sort out. And he said they thought maybe it came from the soundboard or came from some electrical wiring or some shortage. He said, but the problem is the sound was a perfect D flat. A perfect D flat. Is that a perfect one? <laughs> Hit it again. And so that sound was going on throughout the whole time that he was trying to get his music organized and all of the other things. And, and uh, he said, we never could find the source of the sound that morning. They did find it. It was, it was the large fans that they had to help the air conditioning cool the room down. And those sounds were emitting a perfect D flat. But his song choices were in a different key. <laughs> and he kept fighting the D flat with the songs. So when he was telling me about it, I said, uh, well, what did you finally do? He said, I started playing everything in D flat. <laughs> Sound is invasive, intrusive, and irresistible. Sound is invasive, intrusive, and irresistible. Have you ever gone to visit someone and you were driving up, and maybe like the twilight of the night, and as you're driving up, you're looking to see the address. And so you say to somebody, turn the radio down so that I can see the numbers. <laughs> it's like... How, how, how does sound invade your sight? And so what, what Clarence did was rather than fight the sound, he flowed with the sound. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. We wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof, for there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required us of mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. And their response was, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Well, you can. You just have to make up your mind to do it. I want to just talk for a little bit from this thought. Let me move you. I want to repurpose you for a greater purpose. Let me move you. I guess the question then you have to ask, or maybe he's asking us, is can I move you? Would you look with me, please, at the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding when the wine ran out. The mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, there were six stone water pots. And My text jumped into a different place. She said to her, her son, they have no wine. And he said, Mother, what does that have to do with us? How is that our problem? And then she turned and said to those who were the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. 
Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. There were six stone water pots there. Fill them. Fill them to the brim. And he said, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. And when the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, and did not know where it had come from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. Do you notice it doesn't say last? which is how often that's quoted. You saved the good wine for last. This is now. This beginning of his signs, Jesus did in Cain of Galilee, manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mothers, his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. I want to read it again, just making some comments between the verses, or as I'm looking at them. You've heard it before, but I want you to listen. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. When, what day? Third day. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding when the wine ran out. The mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. I want to suggest that she could have said to you, to him. Well, we had some before your disciples came. <laughs> so it is your problem. Woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. What is he seeking to say? I, I want to if I don't get a chance to finish this, I want you to hear this. He's asking her, you've been my mother, the only mother I've ever had, and you've been a big part of my life. In fact, one commentator said, uh, the only person who has known him from birth to death was his mother. So Mary's a significant woman. In fact, let's just talk about Mary for a moment. Mary is a teenage girl to whom the angel Gabriel came and made a significant announcement. He said, King James translation says, Hail Mary, thou art highly favored. Now let the record show that the angel said it before the Catholics. <laughs> a lot of us get upset. But the Catholics aren't wrong. If the angel of God, the one who stands in the presence of God, the one who got so ticked off with Zacharias when he said, how do I know you telling the truth? And the angel shut him up for nine months. Ruffled his feathers. So, so he says, you are highly favored. Mary, you are highly, and he goes on to tell her stuff about what she's going to do. She, she, you're going to have a baby. He's going to be the son of God. He's going to sit on the throne of his father, David, and he's waxing eloquent, and he's telling her all of this. And Mary is standing there, and she's, she's manifesting that she's no intellectual slouch because she says, I have a procedural question, sir. How is all that going to happen? I've never had a relationship with a man. He said, that's a good question. But where I come from, it's not impossible. He says, here's what's going to take place. Your cousin Elizabeth, the one whom they used to say was barren, she's now in her sixth month. For no word from God will be impossible to bring about fulfillment. In other words, what I'm saying to you is going to happen because God's going to make it happen. And the thing that took place was, was this. A simple statement from Mary released the pleasure and the glory of God in which Mary said, do it. Be it unto me exactly like you said. And in that moment, Holy Ghost came on Mary, 
planted in her womb a seed called the Son of God. And then all things that followed that, followed it because of one young girl who simply said, yes. When he says to her, woman, he's not being dishonorable because he can't violate the fifth commandment. He honors his mother. In fact, he's going he's to use that same term from the cross when he says to her, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. We don't see him calling her mother beyond the time that we are here in John chapter 2. What's, what's he saying? I think he's saying, Mother, I know that you have done an amazing job living with me, bearing with me, caring for me, nursing me, watching me grow up, being a little bit irritated because I wanted to be more in the temple than with you guys. He said, but you don't understand. Passion Translation has an interesting note because I want you to see what's happening here. He's putting her in her place in a very good way. Passion Translation says, my dear one, don't you understand that if I do this, it won't change anything for you, but it will change everything for me. For my hour of unveiling my power has not yet come. Now, think about, this is Mary who has taken on the ownership of this word that's come from Gabriel. She is acknowledging that, okay, I'll do this. I feel like this is the right thing to do. She has to deal with all of the things that are going to take place in her life as a result of becoming pregnant before she's married because they did the same thing back in those days. They got it on fingers. Now, when, when, when did you get married? <laughs> Y'all guys understand that. In fact, he carries his reputation that he's illegitimate when the Pharisee says to him, we be not born of fornication. Now, this is Mary who has to go to Joseph and say, I've got good news and good news. And Joseph needs a vision, a dream from, the, from God that says to him, don't be afraid to take her because what is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. She's got to put up with stuff with him. And now in a moment in which she's asking him, can't you do something about this issue? And he says, how is that our problem? Now, if Mary had been Marilyn or Mati or an average black mother, she would have said, oh, no, you didn't. I, I know you didn't say, what does that have to do with us? Boy, and my mother told me, she said, you don't know what I've gone through on your behalf. And we have no idea what Mary went through on behalf. So what do you say when you know that your son is God? You can't buck him. But what you realize is that you have a relationship with his father before he was born. I'm just suggesting, you guys didn't read this in any text and you won't read it anywhere else, but I'm just saying, think about it for a moment. She didn't stand there arguing with him. But I think she could have done something like this. He's your son. And I can't tell him what to do anymore because he tells us he only does what he hears you say and what he sees you do. And so I'm, I'm just saying, we need this problem settled. And then she says, and the reason she says to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Because the father has somehow indicated, I've got this. Do you know there are moments in your life just when you think he doesn't have it, he demonstrates that he's got this. I've got this. And so in her comfort, because she can hear from God, right? 
She's filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized. Look, Mary had stuff going on in her life that a lot of people don't understand. But the, the reality is that is this. Mary, you have been my mother. And that's you will always be my mother, but you can't be my mother now. We've got to go to a different place. I need you, I need you to take another place on the bus. And mother, can I move you? Mary says, whatever he tells you to do, do it. The interesting thing is that the Greek construct actually says something like this. Whatever little thing he requires of you, don't be hesitant to do it. Do it immediately. Somebody has said, if you want to see the miraculous, you have to be willing to do the ridiculous. Jesus repurposed. He, he saw six jars, six large containers made from stone in which they would use them to wash hands as they prepared for a meal. It was just part of the custom of purification. The Pharisees were big on that. Jesus didn't seem to be all that big on it, but they were. And so he looks around and he sees something. He says, I got to make a lot of wine and, uh, and I've got to put it somewhere. And he sees these stone water pots. And he says to these guys who are now standing in front of them, Jesus says, why are you here? Your mother said <laughs> to come and stand in front of you. And whatever you said, do. And he says, all right. That water pot, fill them to the brim with water. Six stone water pots, each one capable of holding between 20 to 30 gallons. So I'm going to go with the big number, 30. He's going to make, in that moment, 180 gallons of Jesus-proof wine. <laughs> this is no ordinary wine. This is nothing ordinary about this. And he stands over it. Someone says, when the created water saw the maker's face, they, it blushed. <laughs> it blushed. It turned red. He's making this stuff, and he's saying, look, you remember that, that song we were trying to sing yesterday? No, you can't. You don't remember it. Because, <laughs> but there's a phrase in this song. As the spirit was moving over the water, spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the spirit was moving. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. My favorite line in the song is, Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart. When you feel the room, you hear. You're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me. Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart. That sounds like something we used to sing in the projects. Yeah. It's fabulous. But what's interesting is that the first thing that we hear and read in the scriptures in Genesis 1 is that in the beginning, come on, God created the, and the earth was, Without form and vo and darkness covered the and the spirit of moving over the water. Spirit was moved over. And here is Jesus who says, I don't do anything on my own. All, all that I do, if I'm casting out demons, if I'm healing the sick, if I'm raising the dead, I am doing it by the Holy Spirit. So this work that's taking place with this wine is not just happening because Jesus has found out what abracadabra means. He knows what it means to invoke the power of the Holy Spirit to bring about order out of what they call chaos. Chaos really isn't chaos. It's just order looking for somebody to interpret it. Spirit was moving. 
I don't know how long it took him to pray. I don't even know if he prayed. But I do know when he filled them to the brim, he said, take some over there. What is it that God is saying to us? Mary, and let me just say, cut it short. Mary, I need you to understand that no one can take your place as my mother. No one can walk through anything. You have a significant role in my life as a mother. But there's a point now in which I've got to say to you, I don't call you mother now. So when brothers, sisters all came to see him, they said, your mother is here. He said, who is my mother? Who is my brothers? Who are my sisters? He didn't say, who is my father? He said, you are, if you do what I want. Mary, I need you to take a different position on the bus. Mary didn't argue with him. There's nothing in here that says, but here's what what we look at in the text. It says, and in that miracle, he manifested his glory. It was the beginning of the manifestation of his glory. Now, look, there are a number of signs John tells us in his gospel and many other signs Jesus did to demonstrate who he was. Many other signs. Now, look, if you have a publicist and he's saying to you, we've got to figure out how to get you out into the public eye so that people can know you are the Messiah And how can we do this? Now, look, think of it. He makes wine. Everybody say he makes wine, which is a really good. Somebody said that's about, that's like 3,200 glasses of wine. 3,200 glasses of wine. But he also, he also heals the paralytic guy. And then he also, multiplies bread and fish for something like 15,000 people. And then he tops that off with walking on the water in a storm. And then he takes spit and he repurposes it (laughs) and heals a blind man. And then he raises Lazarus from the dead. He's got about seven things going for him here. Would you choose making wine? If you are Mary and you say yes, I think what God is saying is that if you're willing to let me move you, you can see glory. You can see a manifestation of glory. In fact, I'm doing this so you'll know I'm closing. My brother, John, we were in a meeting, and and my brother Paul took his watch off as he got ready to preach. And I said to John, what does that mean? John said, nothing. All right. Come and get this. (laughs) 3,200 glasses of wine. That from the moment they filled them with wine or water and he stood over them, a transaction, a kingdom transaction took place. He took stone water pots that were used for whoever knows and then he, he repurposes them so that they can hold something that is going to manifest his glory. What's, what's around you? Look around you and just say, does God still need this? Does God still need me to, do, to be in this place? When we planted our church in Pittsburgh, after I heard Violet Kitely say, hills and valleys, I was an organist. I was a keyboard player. I was a choir director. I was the Sunday school bus driver. I was the, I had so many jobs. You would have thought I was a Jamaican. Um, <clears throat> but 
Well, one day someone came who could really play the keyboard. And I said, you can have this. And then another guy came, and others, and others. And, and pretty soon, things that I was doing, I was no longer doing. And in fact, what happens in a church sometimes is that as a church is growing, everybody is doing everything until somebody specializes in it. And they come along, and we say, we need you. Can you, can you read notes? Can you read notes? See, I, I couldn't read notes. I played by ear, and if I couldn't hear it, I couldn't play it. And I couldn't play anything on a minor key. I didn't know how to work that. But here's what happened. God sent some people because he knew that I wanted to be able to sing every kind of song that you could sing. I wanted everybody who came to this church to hear something that they could recognize. So that I wanted us, and I said to the guys, I said, we need to go from Bach to rock. Everybody can't play a piano. And when those who can just a little bit are challenged by somebody who can play a whole lot, they'll say things to you, well, I've always done this. And the question is, but can we move you? Are you willing to be moved for the glory of God? Are you willing to be moved so that God can get you to the next level? He has a greater purpose for you. So that somebody said, well, well why do you suppose he had to make so much wine? And, and that's a good question. 3,200 glasses of wine. Think about it. Cana is not that big. It's not that kind of party. What you going to do with all of that wine? I think Jesus was saying, I'm going to start a party. Well, let me just back up a moment. I lived in the projects. And on weekends, they would have parties in various apartments. And so people would go to those apartments, and they'd dance, and they would drink, and they would have great fun. And if you went there and you saw people coming downstairs as you were on your way upstairs, you would say to them, is the party over? No, nah, it ain't over. So why, why are you leaving? Ain't got no more wine. <laughs> now, let me show you my analogy, is it? God, the son, is multiplying wine because he wants to make a statement. I'm going to make so much wine that it will never run out because ain't no party. <laughs> like a Holy Ghost party. Because a Holy Ghost party, it, it, it don't stop. I believe we got a winemaker here. Patrick can make the wine. And his, his backup, his homies who play along with him, who understands that he can take, a, he can take a, a rhythm, he can take something out of the African-American community and being white, come and inject it into the African American community or being white and they don't know he's white and they, they can hear him say something and the next thing you know he's got black people acting white and white people acting black because the new wine does that kind of stuff calm down spirit when you move you make my Heart pound when you feel the room. Come on, stand with me. Just lift your hands. Tell God how good he is to let you see this day. My wife wished she could be here with us. This is an awesome time. We've been married 51 years. 52 in September. She's going to be 85 in July. And she'll say to people, Doc, she'll say to people, my husband and I have been married more than 50 years, and we've never discussed divorce one single time. But murder has come up several times. 
But you know what? There's something about being, <laughs> being in a place where if you drink enough new wine, it'll settle a whole lot of things. I'm ready to have another drink. What I want to say to you is that you are about to have a move of God in this house. That's going to change. It's going to change the atmosphere. It's not going to just affect this house, but it's going to affect the many houses that are around. And there are people who are hungry who don't know that the wine has run out. And when they come here, they're going to ask you this question. What's this stuff? And you're going to say, it's the good stuff. Yeah. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood this place and fill the air. Your glory, God, is our hearts to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Not just a song, but a prayer. Come flood this place and fill your glory, God. Joseph Garlington. How many like to see a whole lot more of him? Amen. It'd be wonderful. Thank you for that wonderful word. I was thinking while he was preaching, I was like, I'm going to add one more because he said from rock, from Bach to rock. And I'm just going to say from Bach to rock to hip hop. But, uh, <laughs> But thank you very much. You may be seated. We're going to now go into a special video presentation. And after this is done, we're going to actually have many of our friends and family clergy that are going to come and make presentations to us uh, of pastoral emblems. They're going to do that after this. But right now, uh, my daughter, Haley, Pastor Haley Trevino, uh, put together this presentation of Two Streams one river. Amen. My dad worked for the sheriff's department and was a private investigator for a while and got a call to the ministry, you know, when I was real little. My parents married when they were 17 and 18 years old and had me and six years later had my brother and then my father received a call to the ministry with two kids in tow. He went to Rama in Bible school in Oklahoma. He was Rama's director over Texas over this whole southwestern region. He was one of Rama's star students, if you will. After they left Rama, they were part of a church in Minnesota, outside of Minneapolis. They had some friends here, and they called him and, and asked him to come down and have a three-day seminar, and they did. Everyone here had been praying for a word church, if you will, a much prayed for event. This was in April of 1980. It was advertised in the newspaper and my husband was stationed in Chicago at the time. I thought, you know, I would really like to go hear them. He's retired military. So I went and I, I called him that night and I said, I found our church. 
And when I went, I met some other ladies who were part of a prayer team. And after, at the end of the three days, they asked me, the ladies did, if I was interested in joining the church. And I said, absolutely. These are the people I have been praying for for a long time. That's how we met them. And then God called him back to his hometown and me back and well, my mom did administrative work for hospitals and oil companies and things like that. And then she worked side by side with my dad after that. There was no looking back. The rest is history. We started in a school, meeting in a cafeteria. And we went from there to what had been a, a car dealership over on Old Business 190. And then we started construction of the existing facility and well was completed in, in 85. Youth building was completed in 99 and, and the uh, Family Life Center was completed in early 90s. It was land that was given to Pastor Terry and Jan for the purpose of having the church there. It was donated to them. By Dr. Stephen Van Curl. Probably we've got what, 25 acres of land there now, I believe. Yeah, did, we did we, we got the land and we're wanting to build a building and something that uh, I think is so significant there that we went to all the banks in the area, all the lending institutions, and nobody would give us a loan to build a building. According to them, uh, we didn't need any more churchy looking buildings. They would lend us the money if the buildings could be suitable for usage if we should shut down. They were looking for us to fail. It, it wasn't uh, probably five years after that point that uh, all the banks in the area were coming to us and asking us if we needed more money. We had grown that rapidly. I'd say what, what was big for our, our church was the way that we progressed. You look at starting out in what in 1980, and then by 1985, we were filling a sanctuary of seven or 800 people. Not hit and miss, that was every Sunday we fill the sanctuary. When you start with 10 and end up with 3,000, you know, to go from there to being connected to presidents and governors and things like that, it's amazing. It resonates so greatly, the, the initial vision of the church. It'll be family church, the World Outreach Center, and that's what we, we've dwelled on all the years. That, that's why we, we poured so much effort in. First initiatives were going across into to old Mexico. Several families would go down and they, they would take uh, freezers, loads of food. Pastor Sam Mathias, the mission in, in China. He is in communist China. He makes periodic trips in there, very secretive type operation. Missions in Guatemala, and, and started that. And then, of, of course, the, the South African outreach with Tom DeShell. Yeah, it was no more the trips to South Africa. If Pastor Gary Hay and, and Pastor Terry met the people who would bring us together for the Ethiopian ministry with Gedehu. The mission is so successful. The government gave us several buildings in downtown Addis Ababa to set up our schools and, and training centers. One of the biggest ones for me was when the president of Ethiopia came and stayed in their home. The magnitude, my dad took him to meet Governor Perry. I think that was a big milestone. I think the culmination of those two cultures coming together and how God just opened the doors. And that was from a little church in Colleen, Texas at one time, a little work that started with a few people, eclectic group of people in Colleen, Texas. And my dad loved that. He loved the military. He had a deep respect for them. You know, there would be 30% at times of the congregation every few years that would have to be, you know, transported somewhere else in the world. He just uh, had a deep respect for what they did, what they had to do, and just the responsibility. Terry was not only our pastor, he was a super personal friend, a, a fishing partner and a hunting partner. We were, you know, extremely close, but as far as his ministry, the way that he brought the word forth, there was no way for anyone not to be able to understand the message. That, that's what everyone appreciated about, about his ministry. That you as a believer, You've not been appointed under wrath, but you've been appointed unto his salvation. It was driving with my dad through all these little towns around Queen and 
walking into places of business for people that did not even go to Greece, and then shaking his hand and telling him that he loved him, his passion for that community. He was just a loving, laid-back guy. It was the lady in the cafe that just said, your dad ministered to me, he saved my life. That was not a person that went to their church. But it was a person that he impacted. And to me, it was at those moments and those times that were so monumental. Those were things that I witnessed. I mean, we would be, you know, shopping the mall with my mom and everybody will know how monumental that is because she was a shopper. And I'd be in there and she would be singing worship songs and people would walk up to her and, and talk to her and she could talk to a wall and how she encouraged people to fight when they were sick to never give up to stand on the word of god it was something that they lived they kept their priorities straight and it was what god had called them to do the number one thing that we always had to have in front of us was prayer we never did anything before prayer and there was that deep understanding with both of my parents that it doesn't matter the background that you come from you don't ever have to know one thing about god when you went to Grace. You could start from square one and they would love you from square one. I think, although they were in ministry, they were not from a you know, ministerial background or even a denominational background, really. You know, they went to church maybe once a year when they grew up, but when they got the call of God on their life, they then turned around and were able to minister the Word of God to almost everyone in their family. I think he felt, and I know my mom felt, a deep respect and love for the people and a deep responsibility for their spiritual well-being. They took that very seriously. They not only loved each other with all of their hearts, but they loved God and had a fear and reverence for God more than anything, and, and instilled that both in me and my brother. I want them to remember always how much they loved them, how much they loved what they did, and that if they had it to do all over again, they would do exactly the same thing. That if asked today to come back, they never would, I know, but they would never do anything differently, never. They just loved with all of their hearts. They loved what they did, they loved the people around them, and I just, that's how I want them to be remembered. Many years ago, back in the 1920s, there was a farmer in Canada. This farmer was very wealthy. He owned an extremely large amount of land. He owned sections of land. A section is 640 acres, but the 1929 crash came. It affected all of North America, and like so many people, he lost everything. He and his wife had one child. They named her Violet. An extraordinary pioneer born in Vancouver, Canada, August the 31st, 1925. She received a prophecy at her church when she was young that she would be a preacher. She married Raymond Valentine Kitely in July of 1944. Violet would get married to a man and they had a dream of becoming medical missionaries to Africa. Her husband became a medic as he was conscripted into the military, the Royal Canadian Air Force, and his plane went down and his life was lost. She was seven months pregnant with a young boy who would be named David, and she went into complete shock and became paralyzed. So she was hospitalized. She was a single mom, no income. She now had a baby boy and no husband. He had just died two months before, and she was coming out of a terrible health condition. A prophet that knew her came from out of town and said, I need to go and pray for Violet Kitey. She needs healing. And he went to her parents' home where she lived. He also prophesied over her at the same time. He said, the child you carry is a son who will be a prophet to the nations, and he will have a son who also will be a prophet to the nations. She was healed instantly, and then the birth took place, and of course it was a son. My mother, all her life, having lost my father in the Second World War, ministered to people who were bereaved, and... Uh, People would say, well, how do you know? And she could tell him, I've been there. Mm. When you've been there, you've got something to say that uh, all the theology in the world and all the preaching in the world will never, never suffice for the experience you've been through. She poured herself into the Word of God on her own, and the Spirit of the living God taught her the Word, and she became one of the most in-demand Bible teachers. People would flock to hear her. 
Well, she started preaching, and when she preached, the church she preached at exploded in growth, got large all of a sudden. But the male leadership of the church, the elders came together and said, well, wait, wait a minute. We can't have a woman leading our church. And so they terminated her. She wasn't even getting a salary and they kicked her out of her own church. So she began to travel and to teach and crowds began to flock around her. Two missionaries who immigrated from Canada to the asphalt jungles of the San Francisco, Oakland Bay area. This was during the height of the civil rights movement the Vietnam War, the Hippie Flower Children Revolution, the Jesus Movement, and the Charismatic Movement of the mid-60s. We've been an exciting period of time. We came at the end of 1964 from Canada, started a church in African American home in September of 1965, and we marched with the civil rights. And there was great division, even among the church people, over politics, over racism. That was alive and well. People didn't know how to handle the civil rights. We marched with them because we believed it was a movement of God, and that God was doing something through it to bring equality that needed to happen in this nation and to heal some of the wrong that had been there. And a church was born in the Bible study of this African-American home. And that church became known as Shiloh Church. On this weekend, this Labor Day weekend, 55 years ago, we planted a church. My wife, who was my fiance at that time, was there wow. at that time. And there was less than 20 people. And we made a pledge with communion. We had communion together. And we pledged that we were going to plant a church. And that that church was going to be a church for all nations, all mm -hmm. races and that God was going to do something with the restoration message. They started a Bible college, and then she'd raise up students, and her students would start teaching. Raised up pastors by the hundreds, and missionaries, and sent them all over the globe. And they went to China, and they went to Japan, and Ethiopia, and the Philippines, and hundreds of churches and Bible colleges were open around the globe. My husband had a real burden, as did his mother for the mission field. She trained Dennis Belcom personally for one year before he went to Hong Kong. And then he went to China because he believed God was gonna open the door and thousands and thousands of people came to the Lord. And thousands and thousands of Bibles were smuggled in. We smuggled them in, our family smuggled them in. We'll confess it. It was something that God wanted us to do. Pastor Pilate pastored the first 20 years as senior pastor and turned it over in January 1986. We pastored for 22 years. During that time, the ministry matured and blossomed as we gave ourselves to the work of the ministry. At Shiloh, we served for 16 years as co-pastors, 22 years as senior pastors, and 13 years at this time as pastors emeritus. My husband, David, functioned as a pastor, a prophet, a teacher, evangelist, apostle. He gave himself 100%. I always said that I was this sidekick, but people corrected me and said, no, you were right in the mix, Marilyn. I was saved through children's ministry at the age of 12 and a half years. But my family didn't attend church. They considered themselves as Lutheran baptized. I felt, though, myself compelled to attend church through my teens. The Lord was preparing me for my future as a pastor's wife and minister. I prayed for my family to truly know Jesus. And many, many members of the family, including my sisters and my brother and grandma, in-laws, have been saved because of prayer for household salvation. I was married 55 years and seven months to an awesome man of God. In 1973, April the 7th, God blessed both Pastor David and myself, Marilyn, with the birth of our son. I had prayed for a son. He was given a 1 in 40 chance of survival. When the doctors had given up hope, we received a prophecy. His name was David Shaw, and he called my husband, as my husband was so overwhelmed with sadness. 
because his son was in children's hospital and his wife was fighting infections over in the other hospital at Merritt. He didn't know what to do, but God spoke to David Shock and said, call David Kitely. And he called and he said, your son shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Patrick was born into a ministry family. His father was the pastor. His grandma was the pastor. Mother was the pastor. His father, of course, made so many missions trips. And at 19 years of age, his father felt such confidence in him. We were over in the Philippines together. And he says, well, Patrick, you're going to have to go to this church and handle the ministry of the prophet yourself. You're going to have to also speak over the graduates of this Bible college. I have to go somewhere else. So they parted ways and at 19 years of age, he went and ministered over 100 people. This was the launching of his wonderful ministry. I was going to Bible college in Portland, Oregon, and it just hit me. My grandmother started Bible colleges all over the world. She wrote over 70 curriculums for classes. Her works have been recognized by major theological institutions all over the world. I needed to get back and sit under her. Took me on the side and she began to teach me from Matthew to Revelation, verse by verse, each scripture. In 1995, I started a college age ministry called Impact. We were on the University of California, Berkeley campus, Stanford University campus, and all the schools in the greater Bay Area. We had over 800 students a week coming to worship God. We prophesied over thousands and thousands of young people. During that time also, we were a part of a movement called The Call with Lou Engle and Che On. We took over four hundred thousand young people on one day to pray at the Washington Mall. Then we went to stadiums all over the world praying and interceding for a generation. In 1998, I married the love of my life, Marlena Schindler, and we have had three beautiful children, Haley, Zachary, and Hope. Then our daughter Haley got married to Gabriel Trevino, and we really like him too. In 2008, we were installed as senior pastors of Shiloh Church. It was its 43rd anniversary. What an amazing church in Oakland, California. What a heritage, what a legacy, what a story. And during that time frame, we saw thousands of people saved, thousands of people water baptized. It was such a blessing to serve that local community. And then in 2015, I launched out doing travel ministry and I was preaching and prophesying and teaching in different nations and states and cities and it was an amazing time in the presence of the Lord at the same time I was working in the medical field doing seminars and just going all over the place and seeing God do miracles in many different places then in 2021 I started doing master classes and online ministry and did prophetic master classes and preaching classes and marketplace master classes and so here we are it's 2023. My family and I, we moved to North Central Texas to a church called Grace Christian Center. We are so excited. We thank God for everything he's done in our family and in our lives over the many years. But there's an expectation that God has given us for this time and this season. We are gonna see a move of God take place in Colleen, Texas, that is gonna go from here to the state of Texas, to the United States of America, to North America, and to the uttermost parts of the world. For the time has come, saith the Lord, when every nation shall be touched by the wind of God. We pray things in the hidden world go into operation and God begins to move to begin to maneuver things to come into your path to begin to cause things to change around you. Through worship, there's an importation that comes to our unwholeness. There comes wholeness. And I'm going to tell you, you and I have been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. Glory be to God. We're moving burdens and weights, and it begins here now in this place called grace. 
Keep declaring it. Keep saying it. It's going to happen. I said it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Your prayers are not futile. Your prayers are not going to be lost. But everything is going to come forward. It's going to come full circle because of the grace of God. Wow. 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 To hear the legacy of this house. Wow. To get a glimpse of pastors Terry and Jan beyond the words and the stories that I've heard and to hear their voices is so moving. Thank you. Thank you, Grace Christian Center, for your enduring heart. What a journey to fulfillment of even the words that we've heard them speak and declare over this house. Wow, Kitely family, to have heard of the testimony and the faithfulness of pastors Terry and Jan, and to have lived through many of the testimonies of the Kitely family. I stand in awe that Pastor Haley was a remarkable, <laughs> remarkable bridging of the streams into one mighty river that's flowing deep here in Colleen. And my heart is so full and just overwhelmed. I'm not going to take long, but there's some things that I just really want to highlight. And I just would love to see, I know we've been acknowledging others, but if the Grace Christian Center family, if you're in the house as members, can you please stand so that we can just honor and recognize you? Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is a new season of joy and refreshing and peace and fulfillment for you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there visitors here who are celebrating with us? If you could just wave your hand and raise it high. Thank you, visitors, for being here. And can we have our traveling guests who come in just stand and let the Grace Christian Center family see you've come from Oregon and South Carolina and Georgia and Ohio and throughout Texas and across the world. Thank you for being here as well. Bishop Garlington, there's such a deep history between the Kitely family and your family, and even for me and my family from back in Cincinnati with Pastor John, Apostle John Stevenson, and you spoke a word here that I don't even know, Pastor Patrick, if you recall speaking March 13th, 2022, from the same scripture at Encounter Church with Pastor Steve and Portia. And there was just a slight title change that your title was, we don't have the luxury of time, was the word that you spoke over that same message of the power of God moving through that wine. And I just sat here in awe that you gave. I looked back at my notes and was like, you spoke the same word. The word that he declared over you was a word that you declared over us and was a word that God gave us. And it takes me back to a word that Apostle John gave me when he launched me into a new season and our church there in Cincinnati into a new season. He said, God will give illogical instructions for miraculous results. Illogical instructions for miraculous results. And when I got to Shiloh, God said, as quickly as you respond to me is as quickly as I'll respond to you on seeing that this is the house that I've called you to. And there was a confirmation of Bishop Garlington's name, even in that service, for me to have that peace of knowing I was right where I belong. And so uh, my heart is full here today. And so I am here certainly to open us up into this time of really special presentations. As you see, the table is before me. And I'm going to acknowledge a presentation that was sent uh, for me to give from the pastors of Shiloh Church who are not able to be here. And so I just want to briefly share a word that they've asked me to give to you uh, today, Pastors Patrick and Pastor Marlena. Um, I'm honored to be here today to represent um, Shiloh Church as well. 
and our senior pastors are Javier and Melinda Ramos, who are presently traveling abroad in Southeast Asia. And Pastor Melinda is Pastor Patrick's sister, Pastor Marilyn's baby girl. And they and their children, Joshua and Christiana, they send their love to you, Pastor Patrick and Pastor Marlena and family. And they wish that they could be here today at this joyous occasion. And on behalf of the pastors and the leaders of Shiloh Church, they've asked me to extend our deepest congratulations to you, Pastors Patrick, Marlena Kitely, and the whole family. And they said, look at what the Lord has done in opening these doors for the Kitely family to pastor at Grace Christian Church. We share in your joy, and we know God has great things in store. And as you come together and continue the legacy of ministry, we believe the Lord will bless you abundantly and bring increase, favor, miracles, and a fresh move of the Holy Spirit to you and the whole Grace Church family. And he referenced in this, uh, Pastors Javier and Pastor Melinda both, John 15 and 16. And it says that you did not choose me, but God chose you. And he appointed you, Pastors Patrick and Marlena, that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain and that whatever you ask the Father in my name, that he will give you. And you have answered the call and you will bear much fruit for the kingdom of God here in Colleen and beyond. They love you and they expect God's very best for each and one of you and the Grace Christian family as we celebrate with you today. And they sent the gift with me too, but we locked it up in Jackie's office. So we'll make sure you get that nice gift. I can't wait to see what's in that envelope. <laughs> and I am going to also make a presentation here on behalf of the city of Oakland, California. Um, and this is a city council proclamation. And so yes, I'd like to have you both come join me. <laughs> Oakland misses them. We love them. They grew and raised me up in that city, and I'm so proud of them. I love you, sister. And this presentation, it recognizes Pastors Patrick and Marlena Kitely, certainly for your 30 years, Pastor Patrick, of extraordinary ministry leadership. And it just says briefly, whereas Pastor Patrick Kitely is known around the world as a speaker with a clear prophetic message of restoration, hope, and healing, he is an eighth generation of a ministry family that dates back to the circuit rider preachers. And whereas well over two decades, Pastor Patrick has pastored in the church and worked with the business, medical arts, and entertainment, sports, government, and educational arenas, he is an itinerant speaker and a certified John Maxwell team coach and mentor for many leaders worldwide. And as of June 2023, he is our new senior pastor here at Grace Christian Center in Killeen, Texas, along with Pastor Marlena. And Pastor Patrick has a passion to teach people to love Jesus, have fun, and change the world. And he and Pastor Marlena, they have been married for 25 years and counting. They have three amazing children, as you know, Haley, Zachary, and Jaslyn, Hope Jaslyn, and a wonderful son in love, Gabriel, a very spoiled cat and an energetic little puppy that I know you'll see running around here. And so now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Councilmember Treva Reed of the city of Oakland, California, do hereby recognize Pastors Patrick Kitely for over 30 years of service to communities throughout the cities of Oakland and the Bay Area and all over the world for his extraordinary leadership in ministry and their dynamic ministry team partnership serving us all. Thank you. Thank you, love you. And we'll have them sit over there. I have to tell you, there's not a season in my life that I can remember since relocating to Shiloh in 2004 that they have not been a part of. The anointing, the power, licensing me into ministry, graduating me with my master's in the Shiloh Bible College, the family, Pastor Marilyn and Pastor David, uh, put in the first campaign check into um, my life and their investment in me, and I'm honored that we get to pour into you today. And so we are going to have our presentation team come up. We're gonna do a special installation for Pastors Patrick and Marlene, and so I'd like to invite Pastors Jess and Brenda Strickland to come up. 
Dr. Michael and Dr. Noja Wadiali, Pastor Stephen and Pastor Portia Summer, Pastors Derek and Heather Shepard, Bishop Gary and Dr. Noemi Oliver, Dr. Jim and Rosemary Garlow, which is Pastor Marlena and Pastor Patrick's mother and father in love, and Pastors Gary Hay, who just has an incredible history of his legacy and helping to be a part of bringing this installation and vision of God together. And following this special installation, we will have the laying on the hands of Bishop Joseph Garlington, Dr. Jim Garlow, Pastor Marilyn Kitely, all clergy, grace, board of directors, and I'll call the board of directors up at that time. And so if we could have Pastor Jess and Pastor Brenda come forth, who will present the first installation gift. Right, a bit of an emotional moment. I think for me more than you. I love you much. You're one of the most honestly respected couples in our lives. Honored to do this. At your birth, the Lord gave you a shepherd staff, talking to you now, Patrick, through your parents, your grandmother. As was the custom of shepherds, you begin to etch your story onto that staff. Each mark on the staff, a witness to the faithfulness of God. Some marks were made with joy. Some marks were made with tears. Through it all, God has been steadfast in his love. Each mark chronicles his victories. Your staff is a living museum tattooing the story of God's unfailing presence. Your tattoo, however, is only one third finished. God is ready to finish in you what he has begun. Marlena, at your birth, you were also given a staff by your parents. You've been writing your own story. But then you stepped in and with great love you gave your staff back to God. While your staff was in his hands Jesus began to make it bud. Your staff is alive, it's living, it's returning to you better than ever. You gave your staff to God, didn't necessarily know whether he would return it, but Jesus comes declaring and proclaiming and screaming, I have returned your staff to you. And I am calling you, restore all of your expectations and all of your wonders. Let it restore. Because God is giving you a voice that's going to shake your world. In Jesus' name. Like Jacob, you went out, you crossed your Jordan with only your staff in your hand. And today, you have become two camps. Like David, you take your staff, your story, and you run towards your giants. Like Benaiah, you take your staff and you run towards your Egyptians and you mean to kill them. Look at this staff. And you'll be reminded, Yahweh loves and takes delight in my story. The staff keeps you from falling. The staff defeats your enemy. The staff will correct you. But it will also cause you in this congregation to 
keep this congregation from stumbling. To defeat the enemies that come against this church and to correct the wayward so they can stay strong in God. I finish up with this. No long. You, like Jacob, will someday lean on this staff and say, God has been faithful and you will proclaim and you will teach and you will mature and form Jesus in this congregation and the wildness of the vision of this house that in a city so tiny it would reach the nations it will come again in Jesus name surely the goodness and the mercy the Hesed of God shall follow me all the days of my life. Be blessed in Jesus' name. We love you both so much. You can't imagine how proud we are of you. From the moment I met you, Marlena, I have loved you. I see such goodness in you. I see it unfolding. I see you as a gift to this house that is going to heal many broken hearts and set captives free. Your story is just in the middle. We have yet to see what God is going to do in your lives. We love you. We bless you. We are expecting good things. I mean, look what God has done. It is mind-blowing. A year ago, we never thought this would be possible. And look what God has done. Be blessed. No. Thank you, Pastors Jess and Brenda, for the presentation of the staff. And we will have Drs. Michael and Noja Wadiali come and present the prayer shawl. This is indeed a very prophetic day. Pastor Patrick and Pastor Malina, you may not know this. When your grandmother passed, my family inherited her prayer shawl. And so when I saw what we were being assigned to do today, without anybody talking to us about it, I knew it could only have been God. The prayer shawl, or the talit, as it's known by the Jewish, has very deep significance spiritually. It takes its roots from way back, Numbers 15, verses 37 to 41. And I think it's most appropriate that we read those verses of scripture to you, even as we make this presentation. Excuse my emotions. All right. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Numbers 15, 37 to the end. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make the tassels on the corner of their garment throughout their generation. And to put a blue thread on the tassel of the corner. And you shall have the tassel you, that you may look unto it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and to do them. And you may not follow the hollow tree to which your heart or your own eyes are inclined. And that you may remember and do all my commandments. And be holy for your God. I am the Lord God 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt indeed. And be your God, to be your God, and I am the Lord your God. Amen. Amen. The Talit is a very sacred reminder of the spiritual authority that God has given to both of you, not just over this house, but as a pillar and a voice over this region. And every time you see it, it should be a reminder, not just only of that authority, but the responsibility you have to lead this house in prayer and in worship. Amen. And that it should be a medium through which you are constantly in community with the heavenlies so that this house will indeed fulfill all that God has ordained for it even before the foundations of time. And on behalf of my family, we are honored to present the talit to both of you as you journey on to fulfilling God's call upon your life. The Lord bless your works, bless your ministry, and we will yet hear great and mightier things from this house. Amen. I want to say thank you, Pastor Patrick, Pastor Marlena. You have shown us what the word grace means. We have been part of your journey and it's been a mind-blowing, growing experience for us. You walk the walk, every word you preach, you have shown need and we give glory to God. Only grace could have sustained you and seen you through and brought you to Grace Community Church. We give glory to God. Thank you. We love you. Thank you, Dr. Noya. Thank you so much. And next, we'll have a special presentation of the psalmist heart from pastors Portia and Stephen Sumner, who are also their auntie and uncle. Wow, the psalmist harp. You two have been cast upon the Lord from birth. In your mother's womb, he fashioned and formed you and knit you together and put cords of worship inside of you. Psalm 149 says, praise the Lord and sing to the Lord a new song. <laughs> We're all singing that new song today. His praise in the assembly of the saints. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. And let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name with the dance. Let them sing to him with the timbrel and the harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He takes pleasure in you today. Patrick and Marlena and we take pleasure in you as well and he beautifies the humble with salvation let the saints be joyful in glory let them sing aloud on their beds and let the high praise of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hands to execute vengeance on the nations and to execute punishment on the peoples and to bind the kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron and to execute on them the written judgment. This honor, this honor have all his saints. And so today the Lord just puts upon you a title of a divine executioner that you're going to execute his will in this church and in this region. I think about worship that has gone from generation to generation, 
even the foundation of scriptures that you are holy, O thou that inhabits the praises of your people Israel, that your grandmother. And there was a chair that your grandmother sat in. It was the last chair she sat in before her passing. And I have that chair. We have that chair in our house. And that was the chair that she sat in. And they were going to throw it away. Someone was going to throw it away. And I says, no, I'm taking that chair. And that's the chair that Portia sang to your grandmother. Worship in her, some of her last moments. And then 35 years ago on our wedding day, your dad married us. And Portia sang to me, the, the bridegroom, the bride sang to the bridegroom. And your father said to me, he said, to sing, to sing in all seasons. And to the both of us, sing in all seasons. And so today, Pastor Patrick and Marlena, sing again, sing, 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 sing in every season. And so that's just our, some of our history and our story from your grandmother to your dad. I don't want to do worship anymore. I don't want to just sing songs. I don't want to lift my hands out of ritual performance. I say no. I don't want to do church anymore. I want to be the church. Purify me. Make me holy for your use, Lord. Cause I want to be worship. I want to be your song. I want to be your instrument of praise. So tune my heart strings and play. And my life will dance for you. chords that you play so I can feel your touch every day cause I want to be worship I want to be your song I want to be your instrument of praise so tune my heart strings and play and my life will always my prayer every time you see this is that you remember that song to be worship to be the church because that is who you are amen god bless you thank you so much Pastors Derek and Pastor Heather Shepherd will come and bring the ram's horn. <laughs> Yay. Uh, we were given the ram's horn to present to Patrick and Marlena because it represents the prophetic ministry. And this is really where our, our relationship started. You know, I love that, uh, that video. Uh, that was excellent. Uh, but one of the things it didn't show was some of the hole in the walls that we, we ministered in. And being in being places uh, when there was just a few people and persevering. When I think about the prophetic and how desperately it's needed today, I think about integrity. And I sit as a witness to the integrity in which you hold this ministry, the integrity in which you hold this gift. I was, I was in those holes in the walls with you. We ate weird food together. We saw insects crawl on the floor that we didn't recognize. All over the planet. And God moved. 
God moved. I was your youth group leader. And you were always so beautiful. Inside and out. And you, to me, all you needed to do, to do was be in the room. The light on your life has always filled the room. You're such a giving person, a loving person, a caring person. You care for the least of these. You care for the least. I mean, and you, in practical ways with groceries and deodorant. <laughs> we honor you. We honor this ministry. We, we, we verify, uh, verify this ministry upon your life. We celebrate with you. And we persevere with you. Um, when I was thinking about this day and this time and just feeling so excited for you guys, I think back and I can't think of a major time in my life where the Kiteleys weren't involved growing up at Shiloh. And then we got married at the same time. We had kids at the same time. And our lives are just intertwined. And that's a blessing. And I'm excited because... Colleen and Grace Chapel is going to experience that as well, that ministry that you two have, and just making people feel like they're part of your family from day one. That's special. Not everybody can do that. And I'm so I'm excited for that, and I'm excited that we're still part of your lives. We're only two hours away, so we can come down anytime you need us. <laughs> um, and it's just a bless. We're blessed by you having you guys in our lives and um, I'm just excited for the church and the area and for you guys. We love you. We love you both. Give me a hug. Thank you, pastors. We'll have Bishop Gary and Dr. Naomi who will come and present the anointing oil. Man, we love you guys <laughs> so very much. And um, what I have to say today is to both of you. It's the oil, we all know, is symbolic of the spirit and uh, his anointing and abiding presence. But I don't want to just say things that we all know already um, because I believe there's something deeper here that God wants us to realize today. God spoke to Moses and told him to make a unique blend with spices, herbs, and olive oil and then told him it was holy unto the Lord and was to be set apart and set aside for a very specific purpose. Then God told Moses it was to never be copied in those same measurements. And it was not to be used for common purposes. It was not to be used for anything except that which the Lord said it was to be used for. Holy unto him. The blend had myrrh, cinnamon, aromatic cane, calamus, cassia, and of course, olive oil. Every ingredient that was placed in the oil had a very unique way of being harvested for its specific use. Myrrh is harvested by repeated wounding of the tree to release the wax and the gum for which it use. For the harvesting of cinnamon, the farmers cut it completely apart from the tree and then soak it in water, put it under water until the outer shell becomes soft enough to peel away. Aromatic cane or calamus releases its fragrance only when bruised. Mm. Cassia 
literally means to be split. Of course, we know that olive oil comes only through the pressing of the fruit until it is destructed, until it is nothing but pulp. But what oozes out causes healing in others. What comes out of the pulp heals chafed places and takes the friction out of the rough patches of life. Again, God said, this recipe was never to be made with the same measurements again. And I think that that is because we know it is not the oil itself that is the anointing. It is not the oil itself that is anointed per se. The oil is symbolic of what God's presence is doing only when it's placed in the right hands. When it's placed in the right hands, kings were sealed into authority. When it was placed in the right hands, prophets were set aside to prophesy. But it is so because only of the hands from which the oil flowed. The reality is the recipe is not in the oil. The recipe is in you. The recipe is in you, great man and woman of God, and no one can ever copy it. No one can ever become another you. You are unique alone. The wounds that came over and over and over again until the sap began to flow. We don't like to talk about those, but they do happen. The stripping and the peeling away of outer shells that we all try to build because we think somehow that's going to protect us. But isn't it amazing how God peels it away time after time after time? The release of certain fragrances that are only released because you were bruised again and again and again. Friends that walked away because God split you from them those who you thought were your insulators, you found out God thought they were your isolators. And the pressing and the pressing and the pressing and the pressing that releases the oil. So get ready, God says. Get ready, Grace. Get ready, Prophet Kitely. Get ready, Pastor Kitely. Get ready because the oil that is about to flow in this place will be like oil that has never been seen in generations past. Now that God has you where he wants you, move to Texas. I think it was a word of encouragement and even a prophetic insight from your father's deathbed. But now that the recipe is right and it's in you and you are in the right place, people will truly say, Oh, come, taste and see that the Lord, he is good. I love you guys. Dr. Jim and Mother Rosemary present the Bible. I stand alongside your mother and your stepmother. When I married her, I had I had no idea what I was getting into. <laughs> it's even been more wonderful than I expected. And uh, since your father passed away a number of years ago, when I call you, I will frankly introduce myself as I'm the best dad you currently have. <laughs> this is a special privilege for us. You just got back from Jerusalem. You've been there a number of times. You will probably be there many times. One of my favorite places there is a place you remember, Shoreshem, a little shop with a Jewish owner named Moshe. It's a tiny shop, but he can crowd in on little plastic seats a lot of people. 
we've gotten 40 and 50 people jammed in there. And he speaks for a few moments. The favorite part of his talk each time is when he says, I know what you Christians think about us, that we're trying to keep the commandments of God, and you're covered by grace. I know that's what you think of us, but you don't realize why we try to do that. We love him. We love God. We love his commandments. Oh, how we it's at that point conviction hits me every time. I have wondered, is my life characterized by, I love his commandments. And those under my preaching reflected that. Patrick, you have the anointing upon you. I've seen it. It caused people to walk out of the house saying, oh, I love him. I love his commandments. And with a house named Grace, you know how to tie the two together perfectly in a way that needs to happen. We bring the Bible. If I can just illustrate this first. There was a, a counselee who went to a pastor for counseling and said, I'm having trouble with my life. And the pastor said, write out your priorities. So he wrote, number one, God, number two, family, number three, job. The pastor said, stop, you've got it all wrong. He said, but I listed God first, my wife, my family, second, job three. What could be wrong with that? He said, God is not just number one in your life because that means he wouldn't be number two and number three and number four. God is like the paper you're writing on. He can't be just number one priority. He is that on which all priorities exist. Now, that's true of the Word of God. The Word of God isn't just number one in our lives. It is the foundation on which all is established. And a governmental anointing is on you in the sense that as you preach personal government, how people's personal lives are to be ordered, that brings them joy and delight in the Lord. The government of the family, how it's going to be functioning. There's going to be families come here within the next 90 days who are on their way to divorce court, but we're spun around in this place, and a whole generation will be saved because that you'll preach the government of the family, how it's ordered by the Lord in a way that brings blessing. You'll, you know the government of the church in this house will be ordered in a way that follows with scriptural truth that allows the blessing to pour upon it. And you're in a government town. You're in a military town. And the military is one of the most pronounced extension of actual government life. You're preaching now how civil government is to function from the word of God that can reach blessing on a nation. Because blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. So we bring you that on which you've already established your life. But in this, in this prayers that are occurring over you today... There is a release of that which is always already a depository within you. Your years of study are, are really manifesting. Your ways of pouring yourself in the word of God, when you speak, we all learn of God. And then you have the depository of your father and your mother called into the pastoral ministry, and that's poured in you. And then going back, to your grandmother, Violet. This massive wealth of biblical truth that's been deposited in you through her. Then your great-grandpa, a preacher of the Word of God. Then your great-great-grandpa, a preacher of the Word of God. Then your great-great-great-grandpa, a preacher of of the word of God. I've got more time, so I'm continuing. <laughs> and then your great, 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 great grandpa, a preacher of the word of God. And then before that, there was Adam. <laughs> We've got seven generations of proclaimers from this one book, the foundation of all of life. Seven is a favorite number to God, by the way. It'll be very interesting to see what he does with that. And so on this day, we pray that anointing and blessing upon you. Not merely for the proclamation, but a secondary gift, vitally important, a pen we're going to establish, give to you. The pen, you were given a pen when you were set in place in Shiloh, but we represent it. This is to write. This is to write. 
don't be an Apollos. What I mean by that, Paul and Apollos were both great preachers. We don't have a clue what Apollos said. He didn't write. Don't be an Apollos. Be a Paul. We have half the New Testament. We know what he said. When you take up the pen, reflected today in the keypad, you begin typing. You will preach to 10,000 places at once. And through the electronic gifting we have today, you can now preach in 100,000, maybe a million places at once. So we commission you both to stand on the word and to write. And that's why the Apostle John said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And so every word that Jesus spoke in, in the New Testament is in the Hebrew Gospels. And he said, I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. I didn't come to misinterpret Scripture. I came to fulfill it, to rightly interpret God's Word into your lives. And so we give you this gift, the most precious thing, representing our Messiah, our Savior, our King, the Word of God Himself, that the Lord is anointing you with revelation, with counsel, with understanding and might, with all illumination and fear of the Lord, to speak what is on the page, that it would manifest in the hearts and lives of multitudes of millions around the world for the great harvest, for the great coming of our King and Messiah, Yeshua of Nazareth, Jesus, our Savior. Thank you. Bishop Garlington, if we could ask you to come up before we make the presentation of the seventh installation gift for you to pray over our pastors. He's flying out soon, and we don't want to miss this word. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is so good. There are a lot of their guys that you normally hang out with aren't here today, but I'm representing them in some way. But I'm also glad that I get to do this, and so I will hold that before them <laughs> as, as one of my kudos to just say, but you weren't there, I was there. They can send prayers, but I can pray. I remember a moment when you came to come to church, and I had been preaching and um, the Hebrew word was the word salak. And all of a sudden, that became your hip-hop contribution to the... And I don't know what they remembered from what I preached, but I know they remembered what you preached. <laughs> but it was amazing to me that God could pick up on something that I had been saying, and you carried that. And that's the intuitive, prophetic anointing that you have to take words much like David would have done and bring them together and and communicate a truth that sits in the back of people's minds in such a way that even when they don't want to think about it they have to what was the t-shirt it had to happen what has happened what has happened had to happen so that what is about to happen can happen. And that's where we are today. Would you just, are you guys gonna join me here or am I gonna do this by myself? Because somebody needs to be able to do this. Because I'm leaving on a jet plane. If we could have clergy in the house also come join us and the board of directors as well. Thank you. The song I began with um, is a testimony 
that no matter what I've experienced, no matter what I've been through, the testimony is that all my life, he's been faithful. And I remember complaining to him one day, just, uh, well, actually, several days I've complained to him, but on this particular day, uh, he asked me a question. He said, in all of redemptive history, have I ever failed anybody? And I said, no. He said, then why would I start with you? Why would I break my record? Because of something you've done. And what you're going to walk in is a continuous expression of the faithfulness of God. People talk about paying the price and you guys have done it. And I watched you do it. And um, you came out of it better and not better. And that to me is such a credible piece. And I've watched congregations change because of you and watch you behind the scenes. And so I'm asking God that he will continue to cause you to flourish in this house, to be what he's created you to be, to do what he's called you to do, to stand and proclaim out of that abundant reservoir of creativity that he's given you that the days are coming, that you will proclaim the word of God in such a way that it will ignite fires in this house, in this city, in Texas, and even as we've said, in the nations. Let the new mind flow. Let that anointing from many generations rest upon them. Do it, God, for your sake. Jesus. Thank you. Good, good biblical theology teaches us that we're surrounded by a crowd of witnesses. That means David Kitely is really enjoying this moment. Violet Kitely is leaning over that balcony. She's loving this. Pastors Terry and Jan, they're really so excited about the future. And God has formed a divine quadrilateral. There's the Whitleys that gave their lives. There's a congregation that stood through a testing season as strong as I have ever seen in my life. To the people of this church, I stand in awe of what's happening today. They have been raised up by God, many with military understanding, and they can march and pass through this season of war, difficulty, and bring this church to this point. Gary Hay is the third part of that quadrilateral. He's linked to the past and he's tied to the present in a way perhaps like no other. Ask him how many times he'd come here. He has no idea how many times he'd come here. Way before, back in the day, interim period, and now. And then you are the fourth leg on that quadru quadrilateral, a divine quadrilateral that's coming together. I marvel how every time God does something, he converges things and they all hit. We cannot explain. Father God, we pray now for this new fresh anointing to be released upon them. And by faith, we see an explosion of truth and holiness and righteousness that becomes an attractive force here in central Texas that causes people inexplicably to get in cars and drive long distances because they know Jesus is in the house. They long for his touch. They long for his presence. And they come here and he does not disappoint. Father, I could hardly recover from the first song. You walk in sick, but you walk out healed. You come bound, but you go free. All of these faith statements are going to be lived out by people who don't even know today about this church. Maybe you don't even know this couple, but this will be the place of healing for them. It's about to be released in an enormous way across this entire geographical region. And then 
It's like laser beams going from this place as the military is sent out. Just like the first century gospel exploded through the Roman military who had come to Christ. And now through military here, the gospel is going to be paid for, missionaries paid for by the U.S. government as they're sent everywhere all over the earth carrying the truth and the power and the fullness of the message from this place. We now agree together to commission them, to install them. Lord, propel them into the future from this moment we're at right now. And thank you for that anointing that is now coming upon in new ways they do not even know and have never experienced in their past. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 I got to speak. I, I didn't recognize my own voice, but I got to speak during the film. And I thought, who's that? It was me. <laughs> I did a lot of talking, so I'm not going to do much now. But I'm a very proud mother and mother in love today because this is a holy moment. This is holy ground and God's presence is here in a significant way. You know when you feel the presence of God that everything is A-OK -okay, and it's on the right track and it's meant to be and that's how I feel about my son and his wife's ministry here. And I'm just overjoyed. <laughs> Pastor Gary, oh, here you are. He will present our seventh gift for the installation. Guys, my heart is really full. These represent the next part of the race. I woke up this morning, uh, not planning any of this, but I was just inundated with thoughts of Nehemiah, the comforter. He had a mandate from God. He arrived with letters from the king, the ability to requisition what was needed. He rode around the city that had been destroyed as gates had been burned. It looked desolate. Stones were scattered all over the mountain. They used to guard the city. As he rode around, most people would have said, this is impossible, too much rubble, and the people did. But I believe the Spirit of God says, the rubble is the resource. People had a mind to work. They heard a voice. They rebuilt in front of their homes. They banded together as one person because this is a circle. Not just a wall, it's a circle. The enemy was used to coming over those walls and destroying everything, even though there was worship taking place in the temple. Very much like this city. This church in particular has learned to grieve deeply, but it's also learned to survive because the foundations were well laid. Some somewhere in the process, they began to gather those stones and stones that were burned that had been left in the weeds and left rolling down the mountain. They gathered burnt stones, cracked in the heat, useless for most things, but they were what God used. Those burnt stones in the wall testified. He counted me out, but here I am. God has anointed you both. Through circumstances, we shouldn't have ever known each other, but we knew you at the right time because it was God's hand. I'd like you to each take one of these because they, they talk about a time of handoff. 
It's been a long time. But now you hold them. And you need to run. And run well. And you will. Because unlike most races, the one that handed it off to you doesn't just disappear. He's running with you. And he will not relinquish. He will not stop until the race is done. And one day, maybe you'll hand it off to someone else. But today, run, my brother. Run, my sister. The Lord's near to those that have a contrite heart and a broken spirit. And I'm looking at two that do. It takes one to know one. There's burnt stones all over this region that God intends to build a house from. Those that are forgiven much, love much. And we'll see that grace extended for generations as a result. I love you both. I'm so proud of God. This has been quite a journey. But it's worth it. God bless you both. God bless you both. Love you. We're actually going to hear from pastors Patrick and Marlena now. Let's welcome our pastors of Grace Christian Center. Hallelujah. Amen. Woo. A lot has been said and done here today. I always say this when a preacher wants to sound well-read and considered to be a deep thinker, they quote C.S. Lewis. And so I'll say C.S. Lewis once said, this moment contains all moments. Grandpa Jim, you said it. It's a convergence. There's a convergence of past, present, and future taking place right now. This is a holy moment. This is a spiritual moment. We're not just going through motions here. God's up to something big. And as I look at you all, our family, because God's joined in our hearts and he's done a quick work, I am so excited. I'll speak on behalf of my family. We are so excited to be here and to be a part of this house and this legacy. And I can say with all our heart, we love you, and we can't wait to do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this, Grace. Let's do this. Amen. Well, like Pastor Patrick said, we are just so blessed to be here, so honored to serve this house, to be in Colleen, and to just be a part of what God is going to do, because he is about to do big things, and we're just... Come with expectation. That's what I even said about this weekend. Just come with expectation because God is always faithful and he will always meet us. And I know one thing about this church is the people here are so hungry for God. They're so hungry for God. And he is going to meet you. He's going to meet you because he is faithful. And so we are honored to be here, a part of this family and a part of Colleen and this has just been a blessing for us, and um, we just thank you for welcoming us, and we just love you all. Amen. 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 And uh, so the plan is, I'll just tell you the plan. I'm jumping in, Treva. We're going to have a celebration song here at the end, and then we have a cake reception for everybody in the lobby. Does that sound good? And then tomorrow, we're going to come back for the 10 a.m. service. And it's the 43rd anniversary. We're going to celebrate and have a celebration service. And Pastor Jess, where's Pastor Jess? He's going to preach the word tomorrow. And we're going to have a wonderful time in the house. And so I hope those 50 people who, who took your cards out invited a few people. We went to Bubba's. And our waitress, we invited her and her family to church. And we had that one, because I talked about this, one meaningful conversation turned into a divine appointment in the middle of Bubba's. <laughs> and so I'm telling you, 
compel them to come because God's doing something awesome in this house. So as, the, as all the pastors and leaders, you can go sit down. We're going to finish with one worship song. And uh, Deuce and Haley, if you could lead us in the band. Let's give it up for the worship band and the team today. How many enjoyed that? Amen. They're going to be with us tomorrow as well. Amen.
what he has done in sealing the installation of Pastor Dr. Patrick Heitley as the senior pastor of Grace Christian Center. Yes, hallelujah, it's done. And even as we heard Bishop Garlington say, whatever God tells you to do, keep doing it. You've been doing it, you were doing it before. As we heard in your legacy, we know that you'll continue to do it. And we will see the illogical instructions of God continue to bring you into the miraculous move of God. And I just want to share that one of the things that Pastor Patrick shared, and he is here, he and Pastor Marlena are waiting to meet you at the cake reception. But he shared when he gave that word in the same passage that Bishop Garlington gave tonight, when he gave that word to us last year, he said that you don't have the luxury of time, that there will be a multiplication anointing of strategies for souls, for cities, for states, for nations to impact lives in this region. We believe through, through Colleen like never before. So we just want you to go forth with joy. This is his birth year of Jubilee. And I believe that even as it's Pastor Patrick's birth year, his 50th year of Jubilee, that God is gonna restore, return, and get back here in this house and in his life. Everything that God purposed, planned, anything that was reneged on, set aside, set back, stolen, it is finished, it is his, and it is yours. So let's go, let's rejoice in the Lord. And as we leave, I just wanna acknowledge our sister Lori. Thank you for standing strong. Thank you for your enduring strength and the resilient strength of this church. You are triumphant in the Lord. We love you. God bless you.